Uh, so, hello, thank you to, to be here. Uh, the first thing I want to say, even if Mark already said it, is that we are giving a concert at the social event tomorrow. Uh, and in this concert, we are going to use Python heavily, even if it's not very visible in the concert. So uh, I propose to have this talk to explain why and how we are using Python for making music. So this is the theoretical part. And if you don't believe that it works, just come tomorrow to the social event and listen. So a very usual question when you meet someone in a convention like this one is, and uh, what are you using Python for? And my answer is a little bit less usual. It's, well, mainly for real-time audio processing in live music context. And this is quite unexpected. And uh, it sometimes triggers reactions like, what, are you crazy? Why Python for this kind, of, uh, this kind of thing? And as it happens, the answers are very easy. Are you crazy? Yes, we are, definitely. And why Python? Because it's fun. So I could stop here. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice meal. <laughs> Thank you. But as I was lucky enough to be allotted, um, 45 minute slot for this talk, I think I can get into some more detail than that. So first, some elements of context. My name is Mathieu Amiguet. I'm a musician and a developer. Uh, I'm, an, I'm artistic director at Les Chemins de Traverse, jointly with Barbara Minder. And Les Chemins de Traverse is a collective of musicians that plays in a variety of styles, from Renaissance repertoire, <laughs> to algorithmic, al algorithmic composition. By the way, this music was generated by Python, but that's not at all what I'm going to talk about today. Um, one thing we've been researching quite a lot for the last decade or so is augmented instruments. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's um, taking an acoustic instrument, like you know, a flute, a violin, piano, or something like that, um, and trying to extend the sonic possibilities of this instrument using new technologies and um, especially computers. Uh, so why the strange name augmented instruments? Actually, it comes from augmented reality. In augmented reality, we mix real-time views of the world with synthetic information that we add to, to the image. Um, and augmented instruments uh, do the same. They make they mix real-time acoustic sound of the instrument with processed audio. Uh, so, in a sense, augmented instruments are augmented reality applied to music. As a side note, it's not that important in that talk, but it's very important in our research. Uh, we decided to use only free software for our research, so we are making music with Linux and free software. Uh, that's not a very common choice in the, in the music world, uh, but uh, I guess we would have end up to, to use Python even if we hadn't uh, decided for this, um, this uh, restriction. Anyway, the definition of augmented instruments is a little bit uh, theoretical. Uh, wouldn't you have an example? Actually, I will show you a, a set of examples. The first one is very, very simple. You have a musician. I pictured a flutist because that the instrument I play, but it could be uh, any instrument. Um, and 
He plays through a speaker, so you have a set of uh, microphones, wires, amplificator, and everything. Uh, and uh, this goes to a, a speaker. Uh, and in a very simple setup, you could simply add a delay module that will, like uh, his name suggests, delay the sound uh, in time, so sh uh, a time shifting of the sound. Um, and the musician can have a food controller he needs a food controller because uh, the hands are already uh, busy playing the instrument. Uh, a food controller to control the, the time of the, um, of the delay, the length of the delay. And even with a very simple setup like this, you can already do some interesting things. Okay, so that's not bad for very simple setup and one flute playing. So this is really one flute playing with itself. There's no pre-recorded sound or anything. Um, I'm not sure Telemann had envisioned this way of playing his music, but actually it works pretty well. Um, for this kind of setup, you really don't need a computer. You can do it with a hardware pedal and it's uh, cheaper, it's easier. Uh, but if you get a little bit crazy with delays and become, uh, begin to have several delays wired in strange manners uh, uh, and uh, the delay times are linked one to another, uh, it's not that clear that it's better to do it with hardware pedals. Uh, in this example, uh, with a set of four delays that are set up in the right manner and if you play the right notes in the right time, you can get some interesting effects. By the way, this is an excerpt on a, of a piece we are going to play tomorrow at the social event, so if you, if you like it, uh, just come to the concert. Um, so we are quickly reaching the point where it might be more reasonable to use a computer instead of multiple hardware pedals. Uh, but it's still relatively easy to do it with stock software, you know, you're, you're just taking existing software and wiring it the, the right way and it, uh, uh, you can play it. Uh, the next example is a little bit more complicated. Um, I, I'm going to show you a, a complex piece of music with a strong architecture, with a beginning, a middle, an end, and really uh, an evolution, uh, and uh, many things happening on the technical side. Uh, many uh, volumes changing and uh, loops being recorded and loops being triggered and it becomes unpracticable, unpracticable for the musician to, uh, to control all the details himself. So either we have a technician uh, that does all the you know, knob turning and button pressing uh, while the musician plays. But that's not exactly what we want to do with augmented instruments because we want them to be musical instruments that can be played by one person. Um, so the other, the other possibility is to have um, choice that are made in advance and encoded uh, in the computer uh, uh, a way or another. So, uh, in this example, we have a state machine, and um, when uh, the, um, the musician presses on the buttons of the food controller, he triggers state changes. Uh, I'm going to from this stage to this state, uh, and this triggers a set of action like uh, changing volumes or, or recording a loop or something like that. Uh, and so, uh, many things happen, but the musician has only a few simple actions to make, and hopefully uh, 
uh, it frees up his um, head to do better music. Thank you. So, as I said before, everything is played live. There are no pre-recorded sounds. Um, I once played this piece in a wedding party, and uh, after I played it, some, someone, um, a professional musician, came to me and said, uh, oh, that's, that was nice, your, your piece, uh, your kar karaoke-like piece. Uh, and I said, uh, well, no, it's not really karaoke. Uh, you really uh, have to understand that the idea is that uh, everything is played live in the, in the concert. Um, <clears throat> Also, we are slowly exiting the realm of existing software, of stock software, because here the box state machine doesn't really exist with the right connections and everything, so we had to, to develop this part ourselves to, to play this piece. Um, perhaps a last example. Uh, it's very similar, uh, but there's an interesting thing. Uh, 
until now, I showed you only things with loopers and delays, and uh, so only time shifting, if you want. Uh, it's, of course, also possible to add effects of all kinds uh, or synthetic sounds, but that's not something we do much synthetic sounds. But uh, and in this one, something funny is happening. If you look at the um, um, at the bottom blue path that goes through a looper and then something we call an envelope for lower, um, what comes out is a red um, uh, uh, red path. So uh, an audio path is getting is transformed into a control path for another an, an, another sound, and that's something. Uh, funny to do and also that we had to develop ourselves. <laughs> If you think of a, of a solo flute piece, probably you don't picture this kind of sound, and that's exactly what we, we are trying to do, to extend as much as possible the sonic possibilities of the instrument. And actually, for a few years, we, we have been doing this kind of thing, and everything was going very smoothly, uh, using partly existing software, so free software, as I told you, so Superlooper, GuitarX, Rack Rack, this kind of thing. Uh, also custom fragments uh, written in audio programming languages, so specialized uh, programming languages for audio. Uh, we mostly used Chuck, but we also had a few experiences with uh, Pure Data, Super Collider, uh, Never See Sound, but we could have done uh, this kind of thing. Um, and we would connect everything with Jack. I don't know if you're, familiar, you're probably not familiar with Jack. Uh, for once, it's one of the best um, recursive acronyms in the in the history of free software. Jack is the the Jack Audio Connection Kit, um, and it's a software that allows it's an an audio audio daemon. Uh, that allows to connect different audio applications uh, on the same computer uh, in the same way would, you would connect uh, different um, audio, you know, rackable audio units uh, with, uh, with jack cables. Uh, but you do it uh, in software. It's, uh, it's very nice. And we would manage everything uh, with bash scripts, so uh, simply uh, launch the, the software we needed and connect everything. And uh, everything was, was good, we thought. But then we hit a wall. We had a big problem, and we realized that we couldn't go on uh, the, the same way. We had to change something uh, very fundamental in our way to, to do it. What was the problem? The problem was that we were able to play single, single songs, single tunes, uh, very easily. But we couldn't. Uh, go smoothly f from one song to another. Uh, what we had to do was uh, launch the right script, then play the song, and then go to the computer, quit everything, stop every sound, launch a new, a new script, and then we could continue. And that's not that nice in a, in a concert. You know, sometimes you want to crossfade from one song to another, or, or simply, um, uh, it's also not so nice on stage to have some, someone going to a computer and bending and uh, typing in things. Uh, and, and that's not very, very nice to look at. Um, so, and of course, a possibility could have been to have some kind of uh, mega patch with every song encoded, uh, every song uh, ready to go. Um, and uh, just going from one to another. But uh, we have two problems with this. The first one is performance. If you have every possible song running in parallel, uh, you, you are likely to have some performance problems uh, on your computer. Um, 
And the other, other problem is that uh, we really wanted to have a modular approach because uh, we compose songs and then w when we make gigs, we say, well, I'm going to play that song and that song and that song, but f maybe for another gig, I will take another song and uh, the first one of the first gig and, you know. Uh, so we really had to, to have a modern way of uh, of implementing our songs uh, and then uh, reusing them in uh, in gigs or in, in sets in set lists. Um, so what we needed was some kind of uh, gig framework, you know, like in web framework, uh, but for gigs. Uh, the the flask of the gigging musician, if you want. Uh, and what we realized is that. That's, that's something really, really difficult to do in audio programming languages. Audio programming languages are very good at programming audio. <laughs> They'd better be. Um, but uh, they lack, you know, the higher abstractions, the meta programming features uh, that make it easy to make something that looks even remotely like a framework. So we did quite a lot of research. And finally, we found this. PIO. PIO is a dedicated Python module for digital signal processing. It's a very nice module uh, developed mainly by Olivier Bélanger uh, in the University of Montréal in Canada. Um, and actually, I was also already quite familiar with Python before. And when I saw this, I, I, I thought, well, <laughs> uh, sounds nice, but if you know anything about uh, real-time audio processing, uh, you should be quite skeptical. Uh, are you? <laughs> um, you should be quite skeptical because uh, it's very likely that Python is too slow for uh, real-time audio. And even if it's not too slow, uh, things like um, memory management, you know, garbage connections, uh, and this kind of thing, uh, are very likely to introduce uh, too much latency. Uh, and uh, so you, you get clicks in your audio, and that's not nice. Uh, however, PIO does work because it works more or less like a marble run. This one. Um, the idea is that you have blocks with, uh, and you can uh, build paths with these, blo and these blocks. Uh, and in this example, if you drop a marble on a finished path, it will just uh, follow the path on a normal speed, on its own speed, um, even if you were slow to build the, the path. And you can build a second path while, um, while marbles are running down the, the first one and then just you know, switch to the, to the other. You just have to be a little bit careful uh, on the moment of the switch, because if there's a marble at that time, it, it will go out. But um, you can do things relatively slowly uh, and then have the path um, run uh, at, a, at a higher speed. And that's exactly what uh, Pio is doing. Um, Pio has an audio engine that's implemented in C. It's very efficient, very lightweight, very nice. Um, sorry. <coughs> um, and uh, there are bindings to Python uh, that give you building blocks uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, hooks to change things uh, at all kinds of, uh, of places. And so uh, all the heavy works of, uh, of dealing with, um, uh, with audio samples and, uh, and uh, memory and everything uh, low level is completely invisible. And you just have the nice colored blocks and you construct your path. So um, this is not a toy convention, this is a Python convention. So maybe I can get a little bit more precise on how it works. So remember the first example I showed you, the Telemann Canon played by one musician. Uh, how could we impl implement this uh, in Pio? Actually, it's very easy. First, you need some boilerplate code, but really not that much, just an import, create what's called a server, that's the, the audio engine 
and then later on you will start the server and find a way to keep the, um, uh, the main thread uh, alive because uh, the server is started on a uh, different thread. Uh, and so if you just uh, say server start and stop there, uh, the script will quit. So one way is uh, launching a GUI. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, we don't use a GUI on stage, so we, we don't launch a GUI, but uh, that's not that important. Then we try to do the, the, the upper path on, on, the, um, on the drawing. Uh, so just having the sound of the musician going to the speaker. And that's really easy. You just have to create an input object. And the input object will represent the, the audio stream coming from the input of the program, so uh, from the sound card. Um, and then if you call on any stream, any audio stream of Pio, if you call the out method, it will send uh, this stream to the output of the program. So this is a fully working program that will uh, just get the, the sound through. So that's, uh, that's not bad with uh, what, one, two, three, four, five lines of codes. Um, for the second part, the one that goes through the delay, uh, that's not much more difficult. Uh, we have um, several delay objects in Pio. Uh, here I, I use the simple delay. Uh, and the first argument to, uh, to our, uh, a Pio object, they are called, so to an audio stream, uh, is the input. So here, the delay will take uh, its input from the, the input object we, we created. And then, as we want uh, the delay to, to go also to, to the speaker, we call the, the out method uh, on it. And we have a, a third path to implement, that's the red one. So I want to use a food controller to uh, tap tempo the length of the delay. Uh, for this, uh, this code is using FooCoco, the food controller controller, uh, which is a, a small uh, library I implemented to use uh, the Softstep food controller with, um, with Pio. And uh, so some boilerplate code, uh, but what's interesting is uh, B1 equals press button 1, uh, so mainly I'm making uh, an object that represents the, the t all the times when I press a button on my food controller, and then uh, I, I make a timer object uh, that will uh, compute the time between two successive presses. Uh, so if I press and then I wait three seconds and I press, uh, it, it will contain the, the number three. And it's, uh, it's also a stream of data which uh, continuously uh, contains this information. Uh, and then I just say to my delay object, so uh, the length of the delay will be the value of the timer. And this is a full implementation of what you see above. Uh, and uh, it's really usable uh, in a concert. I mean. You have to do some work to set up your computer so that it can uh, deal with uh, low latency audio. That can be some work, but uh, the code uh, the code can work uh, like this. So we are very happy, but we still have the wall because if I want to go to another another song, I'll have to kit this script and launch another one, and I have gained nothing, or almost nothing, because now I have Python. So we really needed to, to do some kind of, um, uh, of framework, uh, and we thought we have to modelize our gigs or our sets uh, in a simple way. So uh, we said our gigs will be uh, modules, and uh, we have some naming convention. For instance, uh, if I say scenes equals and uh, a list after that, that will be the scenes or the, the tunes uh, that I want to, to play in my gig. Scenes are also modules, so that means that I will take advantage of uh, the import dynamic importing capabilities of Python. Um, 
And then uh, some setup code, so uh, I'm, I'm saying, well, uh, for, for this gig, I will have two microphones, and I want to be able to, to, to cross-fit from one to another. Uh, and I have some kind of uh, blackboard object uh, that uh, anyone can read or write, anyone mean the gig and the, and the scenes, uh, the tunes. Uh, so, um, I can, for instance, in my gig, I, I set up my microphone and then I said contact.mic equals mic, uh, and uh, so I can access it from other, other parts of my code. Uh, that's taking advantage, of course, of the dynamic typing possibilities of Python. And the scenes become very, very easy. So, in a scene, uh, so as I said, it's a module. Uh, and I, I can say, well, I, I need uh, to use the expression pedal, and uh, I want to have loops. Uh, of course, I can use uh, all the features of Python. For instance, in this example, um, I had uh, several buttons of my full controller uh, that had to behave in a similar fashion, so why not use uh, this comprehension to make all four of them in one, one time? Um, you see that I used the context.mic uh, in, the, um, uh, in the definition of my, of my loops. Uh, and I also have some decorators to, uh, that provide hooks uh, in the, um, at some point in the life cycle of the scene, so when the scene is created, activated, deactivated, and so on. Uh, and then it's very easy to have a master script, uh, that's the core of our framework, uh, that will uh, find the gig. Uh, in this example, you, you have to call it on the command line with the name of the gig. Uh, so uh, I launch uh, gig uh, EuroPython uh, to 2019. Uh, it will find the right module, it will find the, the scenes that are in it, uh, import every scene, and then I can register uh, some events, for instance, when I press on certain buttons of my foot controller to switch from one scene to another. And with this, I can, I can uh, really easily uh, make uh, this, this kind of gig framework uh, I, I talked about, and it works pretty well. Uh, of course, this is only a principle. The, the real code is much longer. There, there are, there's some error checking and uh, things like that. Uh, so, but still, I think the, the whole framework uh, must be way under a thousand line, uh, which is really, really reasonable for, for the kind of thing we, we are um, doing. And so, this was possible uh, thanks to very nice features of Python, uh, like the dynamic typing, dynamic imports, decorators, code introspection, uh, this kind of thing. To be completely honest, in the first version, we also used some disreputable uh, features like uh, monkey patching, live inspection of execution frames, uh, and <laughs> all kind of hacks. Uh, but still, we thought we needed them, and we had them, so we could have a prototype very quickly. And after some months, uh, we thought, well, this is really, really ugly. We must make some, something about it. Uh, and we, we are getting rid of, uh, of the ugliest features uh, uh, one by one. But still, all the features are there, and if you need something, and you need to do something really unusual or strange, everything is there, and that's something really nice with uh, the, the Python language, I think. So, now we found a, a way around the world. Uh, we see that there is still a long journey in front of us, but now we can go forward and explore new territories. And we are now able to go seamlessly from one scene to another, uh, without uh, sound uh, interruption, uh, or also with, uh, for, for those who know a little bit this kind of thing, also with uh, effects tails, you know, if you have a long, long reverb and you switch to another scene or tune, you don't want the reverb to be cut, uh, but you want to, it to die uh, slowly, uh, this kind of thing. And everything uh, works very well. So my conclusion would be that the combination of Python and Pio really supports our creative process. 
Um, in that it makes experimentation easy. When we have an idea, a musical idea, it's very easy to uh, implement it and test it. And this is very important because we have many ideas. And to be honest, I would say nine out, out of 10 never reach the, the stage. We try them and say, well, no, <laughs> that wasn't a good idea. So if we need, I don't know, three, four, five days to implement an idea be before we test it, we, we simply don't have the time to do it. Uh, and with Python, uh, everything is going very fast, and we can we have a, a very direct path uh, from the, the the initial idea to its prototype. And well, most of the time, the prototype is also the production code. <laughs> and another really really great thing is that Pio is very actively developed. The the main developer Olivier Belanger is very very dedicated to making Pio better and better, and it happened. Uh, many a times that uh, I was working on, on some codes and sometime I, uh, uh, suddenly I was blocked and I would write to the list saying, well, I'm trying to do this and this with Pio and uh, I can't find how to do it. Uh, and usually I would do it, uh, you know, on the evening and uh, I, would, uh, I would go to sleep. And I'm living in Switzerland, Olivier Benanger is living in Canada, that means that he had still a long day in front of him uh, at that time. And I, when I would wake up the following morning, I would have an answer on the list. Well, this was not possible, but it's now implemented, just check out the, the latest code. And it really happened many times. And, uh, well, that's simply great. So uh, I know he couldn't be here today, but uh, thank you, Olivier, for this great work. Um, and this combination of Python and Pio allows us to have the um, C efficiency. It's, uh, we really need efficiency and very low latency when we do real-time audio, but with all the flexibility of Python. Uh, it's also an, quite an ex unexpected use case for Python, and I think it really shows the versatility of the language and the ecosystem, and that's great. Now, maybe an interesting question would be, uh, we are very happy now with the, this Python Pio solution, uh, but what could possibly uh, make us consider another solution? And I can see two places where I'm not completely satisfied uh, and I would consider changing. The first one is catching errors. If you see this code here, I have a callback that would be called when I press a button on my food controller. And as, it's, uh, as it happens, I made a typo in my, in my callback code. I wanted to say loop set something, and uh, I, I wrote something else. As I'm a very, very uh, serious uh, developer, I also documented my typo, but uh, I don't do it all. I don't always do it. Um, and of course, this typo will be absolutely no problem when I launch my script, and it's only when I press on the foot controller that I will get an, e an error. So uh, Pio is relatively resilient uh, in this kind of case. Uh, it won't crash the whole thing. So uh, even if it happens in a gig, it's not the end of the world. But one, one thing is sure, it won't do what I intended it to do, and it can be quite annoying. So um, I, uh, I would appreciate to, to have uh, uh, some tools uh, that would catch um, most of errors before they, um, they are even executed. Another thing is that, like many frameworks in imperative languages, uh, Pio heavily um, relies on callbacks. Um, and uh, callbacks are very nice, they work nice, we are used to it, uh, to them, but that's, they are not always the best way of uh, expressing ideas. And uh, maybe it would be interesting to explore other, other manner of organizing things in time than, than callbacks. So maybe I read too much about Haskell, and now I want uh, catching errors at compile time, get rid of callbacks. I don't know. Anyway, 
re-implementing the, the, our whole um, setups and, and gigs in a new language would be quite an expensive uh, thing to do. So um, I think we would really need to have very, very obvious uh, advantages to, to go away from this solution. But that was just to, to, to say what could be even better. If you want to hear more music uh, than uh, the little excerpt you heard, um, of course, the best thing to do is come to the social event tomorrow. We are playing live. Uh, if you are the kind of old-fashioned people that still buy CD, like me, uh, you can buy a CD. I have a few with me. You can just come to me. Uh, this is our latest album uh, with uh, many, many uh, augmented instruments things, all backed by Pio. Uh, you can also have uh, this uh, album in a demat dematerialized, that's a hard word, uh, in MP3 format on Bandcamp. Um, and if you really want to support the platforms instead of supporting the musicians, you can also stream from Spotify, Deezer, Google, and uh, virtually any streaming platform. So. That's it. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I think we can take one or two questions. And of course, I'm available after, after my talk to, to answer questions one, one by one. Thank you for your attention. Hello. So Thank you for this insightful presentation. I'm just curious to know how you chose to annotate your music, music score in order to know which uh, foot button to press at what time. Sorry, I didn't get it. So I said I'm curious to know um, how you chose to annotate your music score, your partition, yeah, yeah. Uh, in order to know which foot button to press at what time. <laughs> That's a, that's a big problem, how to, how to write. We, we do s quite some compositions for, for augmented instruments, and the, the writing part uh, is, is a real problem. Uh, sometimes we just have you know, uh, standard uh, music scores, and we just annotate uh, like numbers or things like that. Uh, sometimes we uh, really have a completely different notation because we uh, we don't have uh, uh, any use for the, the traditional uh, five uh, five lines uh, notation, uh, but actually we don't really know. And uh, sometimes it's even the code that that's slowly becoming the um, the score. Uh, it happens that we you, you, we also do a, a lot of uh, improvisation on so on canvases, uh, and sometimes. Uh, we don't even write anything, and if we have a question, we go to and look the code and say, oh yes, we decided to have that and that and that. So uh, that's, that's a good question, but I don't really have an answer. Okay. Thank you. Another question? Okay, so thank you very much.